It's a real honor to be here today to share with you my mind-blowing story as to how you guys can all improve your patient relationships in your surgeries. So I hope you enjoy. I think my three take-home messages today are, um, I think we really need to know our patients' normal symptoms in order to do them the best service. I think that I hope to prove to you today there are some very practical communication tactics that you can all try and do that will improve your patient relationships. And the third take-home message is rather cheeky. It may be that you might want me to help you, just picking up on that last point about um, arranging that first meeting. I'm your woman. Um, <laughs> So, if you're on Twitter, please tweet me. I'm at Kate Allett, double L, A double T, um, and take some pictures. Now, at the end of the day, I've got a quite a compelling story to tell you. So, back in the 7th of February, 2010, I was 39, an obsessive fell runner. We're talking 70 miles a week. Uh, Mum to three young children, but I'd had a migraine. Now, I never had migraines. I presented slurring. Um, my BP was in normal ranges, no problem there, except normal ranges is bloody high for me. Excuse my French. Um, so I was ignored. I was sent home um, with a stress induced migraine um, to take some cocodamol. Well, sadly, four hours later, this happened. South Yorkshire had a severe brainstem stroke and then went on to develop locked-in syndrome. Doctors said she'd never walk or talk again, but the mother of three defied their predictions. Actually, I had a, a, a scan. Um, oh, there we are. I had a scan. I actually had a right vertebral artery dissection, occlusion, and infarction of the pond. As you can see there in the red circle, that's my brain two years after my stroke at University College London for some research. What was it like? Well, that's not working. Um, it was actually like being buried alive. Well, you can imagine, you can think, feel, see, hear, but move absolutely nothing and give absolutely no communication signal that you are able to communicate and understand that I wasn't actually vegetative, I was actually unconscious, so I was aware of myself and my environment. After two weeks, a week and a half after my coma, I was actually conscious enough to make a little fickle in my ear, in my eyes, to communicate. And it was two weeks before my friends cobbled together a communication board to allow me to communicate because the nurses were still convinced on ICU that I was vegetative, or if they communicated with me later on, I'd be too confused when I went to rehabilitation. Now, communication is a fundamental right, but that's a slightly different issue. So what I want to play for you now, hopefully if it works, is um, what it feels like, what went through the mind of somebody who's locked in. It's pretty horrific, so I'd like to play something now, and fingers crossed. It's me, please pick up the board, please. Can't you see I want to communicate? Look into my eyes, please just look into my eyes. I'm so scared, I don't sleep, I can't sleep at night. Ow! My bloody leg cramp, please stop. No one knows about it. Just great. Can the indignity get any worse? Now, I told my mum, I started my month list. I need to hug my kids. Where are they? This separation is breaking my heart. Is Woody going to piano? I bet Andy's skin's in a right mess. Damn, I've shut myself. Oh no, why in front of Rob while he's visiting? Judging by the look on his face, it's just so bad. Oh, this is so embarrassing. Please treat me like you want to be treated yourself. I'm still me inside. Good from Kate. Oh my God, that poor man next to me has just died. I've never seen a dead body before, I'm so frightened. What if the nurses are trying to kill me with that graphite drip? I've seen the films, maybe they think I'm not worth keeping. Please look into my eyes, I need help, I'm so scared, my heart is jumping out of my chest. 
I think, apart from needing a, a bit of a root switch up there, um, I think it gives you an idea that actually when you've got no, no ability to communicate, you can't eat, you can't drink, you can't punctuate the day with anything. I mean, we talk about overthinking, and I do that now, but I had nothing else to do but overthink. Um, now, my kids took two weeks to come and see me. My eldest was 10 at the time, India. She came to see me and spent 45 minutes at the bedside. Unbeknown to me, when she'd had enough, she indicated the time outside to her dad. She left my bedside, went to her grandma in ICU waiting room, and she proceeded to throw up everywhere. My son Harvey there, who was only eight at the time, he came to see me, wasn't quite happy to be there, as you can see, but for two days after he visited me, he never ate, said anything, he just cried. Uh, and my youngest one there, Woody, um, was only five. Um, and, uh, you know, he used to send me videos from school about what he was doing. And he was my baby, and uh, it broke my heart. But you cannot underestimate the power of a mother's need to be back home with her children. It absolutely was, uh, it drove me. From day one, it drove me. Now, I'm going to fast forward. I was written off in IC in rehab. I was there six weeks before I had a six-week review. In that six-week review, which I was in with all my nurses, family, and everything else, with a wheelchair, the headrest, dribbling like Hoots the dog, um, the consultant opened the meeting and said, thank you all for coming. I have nothing more to add. My track is starting to blow as I'm, the emotional ability is kicking in and getting upset. All the therapists said, no improvement, no improvement, no significant change. Second thing he said, and only the second thing he said in the meeting was, right, we need to discuss discharge to a nursing care home. At which point, I had to be removed out of the room, very upset. From that point, from giving up, up until then, I decided, sod you all, I'm going to bring you, I'll prove you wrong, you've written me off. And all I knew instinctively to get home to be with my kids, to hug them, to run again, was I just looked at my body and visualised. It just came instinctively. I'm a lay marketeer, I'm not a doctor. And, um, and I sit and will. And I'll give you an example. It was a bit later on. But on this side, didn't move for five months. And I used to sit in my bed, look at my big right toe and think, move, damn you. My head, just thinking, looking at it, thinking, move. Nothing happened for weeks. But after about three or four weeks, I got the slightest flicker. It was incredible. But for me, my thought process was, if I can make that move, that being the farthest from my brain, then game on for the whole of my other left side, my whole of my left side. That's how I thought. So the goals then came. It was really ridiculously ambitious to walk out of hospital. I did that. It's on YouTube. Um, to run again. I did that. I actually wanted to run before I could walk, but that's how serious I was. To eat Christmas dinner, to hug my kids, to be home before Christmas. These were all phenomenal goals from that event. So... Um, just to let you know, when I came home, I was sent home with a two weeks, six weeks I had with a community stroke nurse, t nurse who used to come twice a week, um, and I'd have to wait in for her. She'd often be late, and she used to come in. I was 13, 40, if you like, and at the time, I was in a wheelchair, and she was practicing with me, standing up and sitting down uh, each time she came. Now, within three months by my first anniversary, I wanted to run again. How the heck was I going to start running if all I did twice a week was sit up and down like an forgive me, an elderly stroke patient. So, a binder. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I took matters into my own hand. I, I blagged something at the gym, which I haven't got time to tell you about, but uh, it, was, it was my lifesaver, actually. I never thought it would happen. And do you know what? Within the, when I left hospital, I left on crutches, was able to walk 100 or so yards, which I did. I was in a wheelchair. From a wheelchair to sticks, it took me six weeks. From sticks to no sticks, six weeks. And on the 6th of February, 2011, a day less than a year after my stroke, I did this. Off we go. Go on, kid. Now, that, was a, that whole process was a heck of a lot of time. And it, 
Only eight months after that, I did a proper uh, 10K run that I came third in two years back. So that was the start of it. But was it happy ever after when I came home? Are you having a laugh? The family was broken. We, did we have any support? No, we had a wave off the ward and that was it. The kids were messed up. My husband was messed up. I was messed up. I'd lost my family over it. I'd lost friends over it. I'd lost my job over it. I didn't know who I was anymore. I had no help. Um, all the help when I was in hospital was amazing. But as soon as I came home, they all went back to their own lives. And yet I lost all my nurses as well. So I felt totally isolated. Um, brings me on to that. The isolation, the depression was horrific. Um, and it's such a problem after stroke that I think, I'm so glad they say they're taking it seriously, the wellness and physical disability, but it is such a big issue. Give you an example. I'm sorry to tell you this. I was at the lowest of the low in 2012 to the point I was suicidal. Uh, I decided that I had to go to the doctors because I've got a fix-it personality. And I decided to ring on the morning where you can only get an appointment if you ring at 8.30 in the morning. Um, and I rang the receptionist, she triaged me. I have a bit of an issue with that, but anyway, she triaged me. And uh, she didn't want to give an appointment that day. And I insisted, I insisted, because I actually, I wanted to drive into a wall. On my own, no kids, obviously. Um, and I went to the doctors, they weren't very happy with me. He did the assessment, he said, she's very depressed, here's some pills. Uh, Mrs. Allen. It's hardly uh, an emergency appointment, is it? It's not like you're having a heart attack. To which I um, stormed out of the room. Um, and I think uh, that was a long time ago now, but that, for someone who doesn't go to doctors or hospital unless they're having babies or you're really very ill, because I just want to be busy doing my stuff, you know, and when I need the help, I need the help. So that flexibility and that understanding wasn't really there at the time, I felt. I just have to share that, because I think that's the important message. Uh, I have talked to the doctors about it since, by the way, my doctors. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say to you is, what do you think you could, have, you could do to improve the patient relationships in your surgeries? Because I'm going to go on to some ideas now, which hopefully you'll just take away and think, if I haven't already tried that, maybe we ought to look at that. For example, can we communicate better with our patients? If we communicate better, then we'll have better relationships. How can we do that? I recently went on a coaching course, a, a doctor one actually, um, you know, where you know, you're feeding back to the patients. I'm sure you all do that. Let's see. Let me see if I've got this right. Did I miss something? To really drill down to find what the issue is, I don't want to tell you how to stuck eggs, but I'm just um, like raising these issues. Is the patient taking alternative medicine? How, how apt is this, given this morning's story about a four-year-old that died in A&E with complementary medicine? Um, because, for example, I take fluoxetine, but I also am very aware that when you've had a stroke, you're very much more at risk of getting Alzheimer's. So me, like a lot of stroke survivors, will take matters into our own hand in absence of pretty much very good research on preventative measures. And so, I, you know, I've taken ginkgo biloba and I was taking folate and this, that and the other. And a whole nice big raft of po po um, pills. And a friend of mine on Twitter, who is a researcher in Australia, said, why, where's the evidence for this? You know, I'm just pumping myself full of this stuff because I think, well, that all helps the Alzheimer's if you've had a stroke. And uh, obviously, the, you know, the, how, that, how ginkgo the biloba affects fluoxetin um, is, is an issue I didn't even think about, how it negates it. So I think that that's, you know, having some sort of review of what they're doing beyond the prescribed medicines is really important. Keep a patient diary, an informal diary for yourself to know to track what's normal in terms of symptoms for that particular patient, especially important when you've only got a 10 minute window with each patient. Dr. Ollie Hart is championing this in Sheffield CCG, the patient activation measure, which I think is a really good idea. It's a starting point, you know, to measure the skills, confidence and knowledge of patients to manage their long-term conditions. Yes, it provides a snapshot, 
but it will also show areas where you need to perhaps plug so people can more confidently self-manage their conditions. You know, listen to patients' history and understand their normal symptom is so important. Like with me, I've never had a migraine. Now, I found this on YouTube the other day. It's called The Good Patient Advert, and it's an Australian advert. And it was an advert, it's brilliant, about the sort of things people should go to their GP, that particular GP for. But it was done in a way that's really engaging, that's very reachable. Um, and it was a great tool to show patients what really they should be hassling the doctor about, if you pardon my pun. Can YouTube also be used for illness detection? You know, young, uh, young mums with babies so they can detect meningitis. Little short video, 30 second video on the symptoms to look for, how to apply dressing. I know diabetic dressing, uh, injuries need to be assessed and looked at, but perhaps not a great example, but you know, how to apply dressing. Uh, or even to signpost local places as to where you can get support, you know, for assisted living devices so that you can improve the way you live or your patients live. Um, and knowing how the referral system works, a quick sort of 20 minute guide. You know, I think being able to phone the practice throughout the day, I mean, I was on the only the other day and I rang four times uh, and I was on for about 15 minutes. And the, there's got to be other ways of making appointments. So is it, are there other ways, you know, to book appointments through the internet, through text, through email? You know, closed Facebook groups, I have them with my charity, Brainstem Stroke Tips of Blocked In Syndrome. And it works really well that peers mentor each other, so they don't necessarily need to come into the GPs as often if they've got other people. So, for example, JIA for teens, where, you know, they don't want to talk openly on Instagram with their friends, but in a closed setting, a safe setting, they can swap their stories and how they cope and how they manage. Do you address the needs of deaf and blind and physically disabled? I have to say, in my GP surgery, I find the chairs really, really low. You know, and also, the radio is often on, and you can never hear the doctor calling your name out, and I've got reasonably good hearing. So I've mentioned about... Oh. I mentioned about the closed groups, so again, you can apply those to diabetes or other long-term conditions. I think peer mentoring is really important. I'm involved in a, uh, research with the University of Nottingham on that. Well, two pieces of research, actually. And also, could we use Facebook to communicate, for example, the number of missed appointments and what that equates to in terms of time, uh, terms of cost, which could have otherwise been spent on patient care in your GP surgery? You know, that might be a nice informal way, instead of having a, a rather aggressive poster on the wall. I realise not everyone's digitally engaged, but it might, you know, there might be a way to, to get that message across in a less severe way. Um, do you, like in airports, do you have instant ratings? So that, you know, you leave an airport, did you, how do you rate the service? Is this not a good way and a simple way for people at the exit to, uh, you might not necessarily want to hear the results, but at least it's the base point on which you can build and improve and report back on your social media how you have improved. Because I think as a lay person, as someone who's been a very high user of medical services, um, I've just forgot what I was going to say. I think it's really important, I think, to understand that we think we shouldn't necessarily, but we are customers, and therefore doctors should do what we want. That's the view that I have in my mind. I'm not saying it's right, but that's the view. So perhaps, you know, people think they pay their taxes, they, you know, they, they have a right to it, and they have a right to it when they want it, but there's, you can't have that. So it's, it's difficult, but I do, think, um, I do think this simple system is a really good way of getting a snapshot. And finally, I really think having super mentor clinics is a really good idea. It takes away, takes away the pressure on your resources. And also, people like to hear from other credible people. So if you've got diabetes or if you've got other, other long-term conditions, you want to hear from other people. Maybe there's an opportunity to have self-care clinics set up maybe once a month in the surgery. 
I'm not sure. Now, the day I left hospital, and I'm, I'm a marketeer, I wrote this book. Now, uh, Jeremy Vine said it was absolutely brilliant. I mean, it's on Amazon, and it has a lot of stars, and I'm very proud of it, because I got the ghostwriter to write it, and she started writing it with me the very day I left hospital. So if you want a, a no-holds-barred account on what it really feels like to be locked in, that's your book, honestly. <laughs> no. I set up just three months because I felt so passionate that I'd been written off my global digital media charity, Fighty Strokes. I founded it, I ran it, and I did that for five years, completely voluntary, no, no help, visited patients, set up research, meetings, presentations, and so on and so forth. Loved it, but I couldn't sustain myself doing voluntary work. And I don't want to be retired off at 46, so um, I had to find another way to do that. Which, come, which brings me on to the end point of my presentation. <laughs> um, and I've had some really exciting things happen as a result of the work and the advocacy I've done. For example, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister at the time invited me to the Olympic opening ceremony. And you could say here, a northern powerhouse meets George Osborne. <laughs> 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 Wearing... <laughs> wearing uh, crotchless knickers. Now, if anybody wants to know the story behind that, it's a good story, tweet me. <laughs> um, I will just have to say, I did delete the picture, but I will tell you, when I got to the opening ceremony, I can't remember anything Danny Boyle did. All I can remember is my crotchless knickers, which wasn't great, but I had to go up quite a lot of flights of stairs at the... Uh, at the um, stadium. Now, if, just a quick demonstration. That was hard. <laughs> anyway, on that, sorry to be into. But I've also become a bit of a commentator. I did a, a, a BBC News night. We were talking about care homes and some of the abuse in care homes, which is on YouTube again, which I thoroughly enjoy because it, it's not a job to me. This is my passion. Um, and most recently, last year, the end of last year, I gave a talk on why it's important to help people with new technology to voice their inner thoughts. People who can't give a communication signal but are fully conscious inside. They're not vegetative. In fact, I said in the presentation, between 20 and 40% of patients are misdiagnosed as vegetative. So we have, they have a right, it's a basic human right to communicate. Um, and that's what I talked about, really. So if you go on that, I'll get more clicks and they're a lot more popular. <laughs> anyway, just joking. Um, so I guess the question I'm going to leave, and I guess it's a rhetoric question because I'm probably going to get thrown off, is how do you currently boost your patient relationships? Is there anything in there that's new to you, new ideas that you could try? Um, and also... Uh, if you need any advice um, and you think I could help in any way, then, you know, you can always get a hold of me. I'm quite easy to get a hold of. So I've really enjoyed talking to you and uh, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Sorry about the technical bit. Wow. What a lady, huh? And what a, what a comeback. Amazing. Well, amazing. Now, um, Kate has very kindly um, um, allowed me to tell you something about her more recent personal history. Um, only a few days ago, she lost her father-in-law. Um, really, only a few days ago. And so it's absolutely amazing that she's come to be with us today at a time of such um, family bereavement. Um, and she did want to leave you with one last word. Thank you very much. My father-in-law was a very special man to me. He was actually more like a dad to me than uh, my own parents. Um, now, I have to applaud his GP because in the early days, as somebody who went to the gym every day, he was a very young 75-year-old, went to the gym every single day, was a very fit ex-rugby league referee. Uh, he thought he had a pulled muscle in his shoulder. And she insisted on taking it further and having him properly tested, which 
her actions will have say will have given us some more time and more time to share happy special memories with him as a family and i applaud her and i think at a time when gp doctors they get a lot of bashing in the media and i wanted to say that but i also wanted to say that on a medical basis his team in Aintree and Southport have really phenomenally pulled out all the stops. And he did die very suddenly and very unexpectedly. Um, and uh, I just want to say a big thank you.